Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, Getting Organized, Executive Editor at ClassicsToday.com, back here in the Overflow Room. And today, we're going to talk about another in our fabulous series of Great Artist Bad Day. And today, we have a duo of Great Artists and Bad Days. The Great Artists in question are none other than Wilhelm Fort Wengler and Arturo Toscanini, and the bad day they're both having is with Brahms' Third Symphony. Now, for everyone knows who loves Brahms that the third is the toughest of all the symphonies to do. It has the most peculiar emotional trajectory and that it's going to end quietly after music of great turbulence and fire. And bringing off that ending can be a little bit tricky. Even more tricky is launching the first movement. Two chords. Ba, 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 dum, bum, ba, da, dum. Brahms only marks them forte. He does not mark them with a crescendo. How many conductors actually play them the way Brahms wrote them? The answer is, well, vanishingly few. Brahms does eventually want to go for the big, the big cojona, but only at the last appearance of that motive before the coda, when it really takes off and becomes very fiery and passionate. So many conductors want to just turn it into a meal from the very, very start. And what they forget is that that first movement is supposed to be fast and dashing and not so heavy and thick. I mean, the tempo is also critical there. So many conductors are too slow. And it's just, oh my goodness, it just sounds horrible. <laughs> right at the start, right out of the gate, you're in trouble. The middle movements are less of a problem. The second movement is pastoral and beautiful and Brahms kind of channeling Dvorak, except for that icy, cool central episode. And the third movement, well, the issue there with that lovely theme in the cello and then the horn is simply is simply not to linger to the point where it becomes, you know, sentimental slobbery. Well, both Toscanini and Fortfangler, those great conductors, screwed up Brahms III. But there's a lesson to the way that they screwed up Brahms III that I think is really quite salutary. First of all, they left, both of them left multiple versions of the work. And not all of them are as bad. They're very, very different, but they're different in different ways. Toscanini's, let's start here. This is his official NBC symphony recording from 1952. Oh my gosh, it's just terrible. It's rigid, it's heavy-handed, it's, it's straight-jacketed, it's completely lacking in spontaneity. It's just dreadful. But when Toscanini did something, it was like a new, almost, almost a new, conception of the work. He was far more variable as a conductor than Fort Fengler was from performance to performance. And even though there were certain characteristics, you know, the orchestral discipline, the, the rhythm, the, you know, those sort of the accents, those were always characteristic of the man. But the overall conception of the piece could change dramatically. If you listen to his Philharmonia Brahms Third, for example, um, the live one that's now in Testament and various other labels, it's a very, very different performance. Not nearly, not nearly as, as dead in the water as this one, but it's still not ideal. You still get the sense that he had trouble with the piece and didn't quite get it. Um, Fort Fengler, on the other hand, was rather consistent from one performance to the next. That is conceptually, because he was always trying to be a cosmic transcendental, you know, Meshuggah, basically. And so it is with Brahms Third. Yeah, it's this huge opening. The timpani come crashing in. It's all completely contrary to what Brahms wrote. He had, in the finale, he just went crazy with tempo variations and things. But with Fort Wengler, the issue was not what his conception was going to be. The issue was whether he could get the orchestra to do it. Whether they were capable of following him and giving him what he wanted. Oh, here they weren't. It was the Berlin Philharmonic. Um, I believe, yeah, it's the Berlin Philharmonic, and they sound like hell. It's live, of course, because, you know, Fort Fengler never actually made a Brahms cycle. They caught Brahms cycles from Fort Fengler on the wing, more or less. Um, there were some actual studio or intentional recordings, but most of them were simply, 
you, have, you pays your money and you takes your chances. Well, here the chances turned out, ooh, rather badly. Let's see. Let me just make sure I got this right. You know, it's a live recording from 1949 in the Titania Palast. And let me tell you, the Berlin Philharmonic plays like pigs absolutely throughout. And there are moments, especially in the finale, where they go completely off the rails. You know, the part where, where at the end of the, of the exposition, it's going, da-dum-pa, da-da-dum-pa, da-da-dum-pa, and it starts to go to pieces, and it starts to go to pieces, and then da 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 do 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 Oh, my God. The string playing, it's, it's like random. It's kind of like the think method that you hear in, in, in a music man, you know, at the end when all the kids are doing the minuet and G and they're just making it up as they go along. Well, that's what you have here. It's a disgrace, a complete and utter disgrace in its way. So is this. But what do these guys have in common? What is it that makes them so exciting and that actually unites them as interpretive artists? It's the fact that both of them in their own ways were always able to project that sense of struggle. And that sense of struggle could sometimes be them trying, fighting with the music. But when it worked really well, it was not that. It was the music's struggle. Because music in sonata form, music in classical sonata form with classical tonality is just about that. It's about struggle. It's about tension. It's about tension and release over the, the arc of an entire movement of many minutes. It's about getting from point A to point B and fighting your way through, as often as not. I mean, sometimes the music is just charming and relaxed. The opening movement of Beethoven's Pastoral Symphony is not about struggle, but it is about tension and release. But Brahms' third is about the struggle. And in this case, the struggle gets the better of both of them. But, but the concept is there. And I really think that's an important thing to keep in mind. It doesn't justify horrible performances. It really doesn't. But I think it does suggest an element of performances that these artists had and that artists from this period had that today's artists so often lack. Today's artists look at this piece simply technically. It's not hard for the orchestra to play. It's not so hard for them to conduct. And they just breeze through it without thinking about difficulty of the angst that Brahms is trying to project, of the struggle that's part of the expressive message and which should be a part, an audible part, of the interpretation and the performance and the playing. And when artists are so polished and so technically prepared, sometimes it's very difficult to project that because they have to forget about how technically adroit they may be and let that feeling of struggle come forth. And if it's not going to happen naturally, as it did with these guys, they have to beat it into their players and make them do it. So I, I think that this horrible version, these great artists having a bad day, both doing terrible Brahms thirds, is actually a very good lesson. A lesson for today's artists, a lesson for all of us as listeners. So keep on listening, friends. Thank you so much for joining me. Take care.